Hello, people from the internet. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at ABF, and I just want to welcome you to an online service. Before we get to our teaching today, just three quick things for you. The first is this. We would love to pray for you. If you've got anything going on in your life that we can come alongside of you and pray with you, we'd love to do that. And so what you can do is text any prayer request that you have to 97000. That's 97,000. We will pray for you very quickly. Please shoot over a prayer request even right now if you're thinking about it. Number two, if you're interested in what is going on around ABF, uh, our website is the best place to figure out what's happening coming up in the next few weeks and months. Uh, agorabible.org is our website. Go and check it out, and you can see what's going on here in the days and weeks to come. Uh, lastly, thank you so much for those of you that support uh, ABF financially. If you're interested in contributing to the ministries here financially, you can do so on our website or through our Church Center app. The app is great. It's a great resource for signing up for things, registrations, and for giving. Uh, we'd love to have you do that. So thank you so much for supporting us. We appreciate it a ton. And with that being said, here is our teaching for today. Well, happy belated 4th of July. I hope you and your family had an amazing 4th. Uh, thank you, Josh, for those announcements. Uh, hi, my name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here at ABF. And thank you so much for uh, joining us for another online sermon here, online message here. We love that you get to join a us. Uh, we so appreciate you. Uh, Pastor John uh, started off our summer series last week, Excess Baggage, with the topic of bitterness, and he did such a fantastic job. And uh, this week, second week, uh, we are covering jealousy. Jealousy, which can be an icky, icky word. Uh, so, question for you, those who are watching, raise your hand if you have ever dealt with jealousy. Yes, if you did not raise your hand, shame on you because no one's watching it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, everyone here, if we're honest, we have suffered with jealousy. We have dealt with jealousy. Uh, everyone has. And it's tough because jealousy, we hear that and we know it's bad. We know that being jealous of someone or something is bad, but yet how do we fix it? How, how do we solve the issue of jealousy? If you've been around a little, little kids, uh, you know uh, that jealousy can occur very quickly uh, and, and all the time. Uh, I don't know, you know if you know, but I have four kids. I have a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a cute little four-year-old. And I remember uh, it was about eight, eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that, uh, Caleb, our oldest, uh, he was, I think, like six, something like that, really young. And then our our, uh, our oldest daughter was a year and a half younger. And uh, Caleb had received uh, this brand new, like, toy. I don't remember what the toy was. I just remember the situation very well. And he had this brand new toy. He loved it. It was, like, the number th one thing in his life. And he was with it every single day, like, just constantly playing with it. And then remember one day, we, we remember one day, Kinsey had his toy. And she was playing with it, and then it was just like out in the open. We're like, hey, if you leave it out in the open, then, you know, it's fair game. Uh, and she's just playing with it, and she's just, you know, doing everything she wants with it. And then Caleb was just like, no, that's my toy. That's my toy. I got to have it. I need it back. I need it back. And we're like, well, she's playing with it, you know. And then all of a sudden, we see through the doorway, Caleb goes and grabs the most beloved thing in Kinsey's possession. And again, I don't remember what it was. I just remember the situation. And Caleb grabs Kinsey's most beloved possession. And he walks by the doorway where Kinsey is. And he's just looking in the doorway where, where she is and where we are. And he just starts throwing it up a little bit, catches it, turns back, sees Kinsey, sees uh, his mom and I, just, I don't know, just casually tossing her most beloved possession. And all of a sudden it happened. She turned and she said, I, that, that's mine, that's mine, I want that, I want that. And he said, oh, okay, you want this? Sure, give me back my thing. And then they switched. And we weren't even mad, we weren't even upset. We were like, he is one, a genius, and two, a little bit of a manipulator. But it was kind of one of those things where we saw and we were like, that's kind of genius, but we saw that, man, the jealousy, that root of jealousy exists early on. 
And jealousy can be kind of cute with kids like that in, in that example, but jealousy at its core, it's not cute. And we know that. It's a dangerous piece of that excess baggage that we're talking about that can ruin relationships. Jealousy can send us down a vengeful path. Jealousy can derail our lives according to God's plan and can take away joy in our lives. And during our time in in the next few moments, I just want to challenge us to look at the root of jealousy. And I believe that the root of jealousy comes down to not fully grasping the idea that God is crazy for you, that he's crazy for you, that he's crazy for me, and he desires for us to have contentment with him and his plan for us and what he has given us. So before we dive in, let me pray for us and we'll get to it. But Father God, we thank you uh, again just uh, for this time together, Lord, where we are able to freely open up your word and uh, to learn a little bit more about who you are and how you love us so deeply, Lord. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for the 4th of July, Lord. We thank you that we're able to celebrate with our friends and family, Lord. Uh, But more importantly, Lord, may we uh, just read your word and we can fully understand uh, your desire for us, that uh, you uh, want what's best for us, that you've equipped us with certain gifts and skills, Lord. And and may we grow in contentment with that, Lord. We thank you so much uh, for your ongoing pursuit for each one of us, Lord. We love you so much, and we pray, Lord, that you just open our hearts to what you have us to learn today. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right, so jealousy, you guys probably know the definition, right? We we start being jealous from early on, but the jealousy definition is this, to feel feel resentment, bitterness, which is what Pastor John talked about last week, or hostility, toward someone because they have something that you don't. Okay, it sounds kind of childish, but that's the definition of jealousy, to feel resentment, bitterness, or hostility towards someone because they have something that you don't. Now, jealousy, I didn't really want to talk about jealousy my time up here because, man, it can be kind of hard to open up, especially as a pastor, to be vulnerable to talk about things in your life that you're not necessarily proud of. So I'm going to do it. Uh, We saw Pastor John last week. He just opened up everything. And, and, you know, uh, so I'm going to do it and be vulnerable. uh, And uh, but I must admit that, uh, yeah, uh, just like you, uh, I've struggled with jealousy from time to time. Uh, not as much as I used to, but man, I really struggled with jealousy. Um, I remember uh, when I first met my wife, Christina, um, I was 17 years old, and uh, she has four sisters, uh, Lindsay, the youngest, who attends here at ABF, and she's married to Lucas, who is Josh's brother. Uh, there's Abby, who atten- attends here at uh, ABF, she's second youngest. I'm giving you the whole family dynamic here. It'll make sense here in a second. Uh, she's married to Jake. And then we have Bethany, who is the second oldest. So Christina's in the middle. Uh, and she's married to Jeff. They live in Chicago. Jeff is Josh's cousin. Again, complicated, uh, but uh, I, can t- I can send me a message if you need further their understanding of that. Uh, but then lastly, the older sister, the eldest sister, her name is Bridget and her husband is Kevin. Now, I started to know Christina's family uh, very close uh, when I was 17. Big part of my testimony. I think you guys have, have heard uh, some of that. Uh, but from 17 to the age of 23, okay, uh, I was like the only guy like besides the father, uh, Scott Lubert, my father-in-law, right? He had five sisters. Uh, from that time, I was really like the only like guy around. I was really the only guy around. And uh, those sisters are like, my sisters were still very, very close. Um, and I remember when I was 23, I heard about this guy named Kevin. And Bridget said, I met this guy at Kevin, uh, Kevin at work. He's so funny. He's so handsome. And I remember thinking, uh, uh, that's impossible. I'm the only one that's handsome. I'm the only one that is funny. And I remember one evening I was at Christina, Christina, Bethany, and Bridget. They had an apartment in, in Simi Valley. And, and I was over. And again, I'm like, you know, making people laugh. And then Bridget's like, oh, yeah, Kevin's coming over this evening. And I was like, Kevin? 
And uh, long story short, he came over. Uh, and uh, I don't know why, but all of a sudden my voice got deeper. And all of a sudden I stood up straight and I, you know, and everyone was like, what's, what's going on? And uh, I don't know, there's just this weird feeling of like, there's another guy. I'm the only guy. I remember a few Sundays later, uh, he was over at a family lunch and we're sitting and then he's, you know, people are getting to know him and, and he's, and he says this joke. I don't remember what the joke is. And he makes all of these people laugh. And I'm like, it's not funny. Like, like, it was just like, it was like, uh, that's not funny. How are you laughing now? I got over it quick. I love Kevin. He's like a brother to me, but here's the thing that jealousy, it could have turned into a really nasty thing. Jealousy started to seep in. And it kind of can be funny, but man, it could have really, could have really been a terrible thing. That jealousy unchecked could have been a terrible thing. Uh, another quick story, when I was a kid, and, and th- again, this is me just being vulnerable. I've, I've struggled with jealousy. Uh, you guys have heard me probably talk before. When I was a kid, uh, you know, my mom was a single mom for, for most of my childhood, especially in the teenage years. And and she worked nights, and I didn't have anything. Like, my brother and I, uh, we were so poor. And uh, I remember going to school, and I had all these friends that just had tons of cash every day uh, to buy, you know, a hot lunch and go off campus. And I'm eating, like, tuna sandwiches. And, you know, I, I remember thinking, uh, I, I, need, I don't have anything. And I would start working at McDonald's at 15 just to, like, try to keep up with the Joneses. I know it's petty, but, man, I just wanted to have some money to be able to buy things that my friends didn't have. And even as an adult, jealousy kind of still seeps in. Having to do so much on my own without family assistance, it's been hard. Sometimes I look at friends and family or other people that I'm just like, man, you guys have it so easy. And again, that's that jealousy that is being unchecked. But what I've learned through all of this, that God has been so graceful with me. He's been so patient with me as I have learned so much about how he has been forming me specifically. He's been teaching me things, things that I get to teach my own children. I can be a jealous person. And even just saying that is kind of difficult, but man, I can be a jealous person. He knows my weaknesses and and my insecurities. But I've learned that he is crazy about me. Even with all of that, he is crazy about me. In fact, it sounds crazy, but he, God, he is jealous for me. And I know it's confusing. And then let me say this uh, in James 4, 5, it says this, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? In Exodus 25 or 6, in the Ten Commandments, it says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For the Lord your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So you're probably like, okay, well, is jealousy good or bad? Uh, And I just kind of want to talk very briefly on this idea that there is two types of jealousy, big picture jealousy. There's divine jealousy and human jealousy, divine jealousy and human jealousy. God's jealousy, the divine jealousy, God's jealousy for us is described as a consuming fire, a consuming fire that is passionate, that is a passionate commitment to his children, to you and I. It's not sinful nature. God's holy. He can't be sinful, but a holy pursuit that is ongoing for us. A holy pursuit that is ongoing for us. Perfect, steadfast love. God is jealous for us because he doesn't want the world to have us. He doesn't want our flesh, our desires, our goals, our dreams, our passions to take us away from him. That is the jealousy of God. That is the divine jealousy, God's jealousy. In contrast, our jealousy, the human jealousy, often reflects our flesh, 
often reflects our flesh, our desires and wants that don't reflect what God has in store for us. And our jealousy can often lead us away from Christ and so often lead us to destruction. And bottom line, what I believe it boils down to is that our jealousy comes from not being satisfied with what God has given us. I'm going to say that again. Write this down. Our jealousy comes from not being satisfied with what God has given us mentally, physically, and spiritually. God's word is riddled throughout with verses and passages about jealousy. And here's a couple. James 3, 14 to 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from the above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Well, in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? And again, there's verses upon verses upon verses and passages and passages, and those are just a couple. Again, I believe that root of jealousy comes from not content with God's gifts and plans for your life and my life. We are not content. So many stories in the Bible. And I was looking at, okay, what kind of passage or two do I want to look at? And we're going to look at a couple here. So many stories about jealousy. And the key thing is that without a turn of heart in jealousy, jealousy never ends well. As I was kind of trying to figure out what stories I want to talk about, a few just kind of like pop up to my mind. We're not going to discuss them in whole, but everyone knows, or maybe you know uh, about uh, Cain and Abel. Again, th- this is a, a nasty uh, jealousy uh, thing here where we see two brothers. They both offer sacrifices to God. God favors Abel's. And what happens? This rage, this jealousy overtakes the other brother, and it results in murder. We see the first murder in the Bible. Joseph and the brothers, we see that where where Jacob, the father, favored Joseph, gave him a robe of many colors. And the older brothers are just so jealous over the favor and the possessions. And, uh, you know, they wanted to kill him. And then the other brothers like, let's not kill him. We're not that harsh, but let's just sell him into slavery. So they sold him into slavery. We see the story in Esther of Haman and Mordecai. Mordecai refused to bow to Haman, and Haman just gets so jealous and ends up putting in an ordinance to have the persecution of the Jewish people. We see another story of, of two sisters, the Rachel and Leah. What a mess that was. And we see their whole lives are just, they're just jealous over each other. They're just tearing each other down. So many stories that God give us, gives us as warning signs of how jealousy can devour us, can just chew us up. Yet the beautiful thing, though, is that God desires to restore us, even out of our sin. So, For the remainder of time, we're going to look at two stories briefly of jealousy in God's word. Two types of jealousy in two different men. One, a man full of promise and a man full of frustration. So the first story is the story of Saul and David, and that is found in 1 Samuel. So you can go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We'll be in verse 6 through 16. If you don't have your Bible, you can pause it, go get it, or we're going to have the scriptures up here. A uh, little recap here is uh, we're introduced to the rise of King Saul, and uh, we see that this is uh, uh, the jealousy over attention, uh, feeling left out. A uh, little recap, we see that the Israelites, uh, they want a king, and uh, God's like, you don't need a king, I'm your king, and uh, 
coming out of the judges era, judges period was a, was a bit chaotic. And uh, Samuel is told by God to give them a king. And uh, God chooses Saul. He, he anoints Saul to be uh, the king of Israel. And uh, we see that Samuel pours oil on Saul. And uh, scripture says that Saul was tall. He was handsome. He was full of skills and gifts from God, anointed from, uh, by God. He was full of promise, but he was dishonest and he lacked integrity. And it's a tragic tale. We see that there's the the rise of King David, the young shepherd who uh, becomes uh, the king to be. And we see that he slays Goliath and David becomes a general and has huge victories. And the fall of King Saul is a warning story for all of us to not get into the jealousy of comparing our lives to other people. So we're going to read this story briefly. Just we're going to pick it up here in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6 through 16. It goes as this. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. We can pause there. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, I'm a competitive person, and uh, yeah, I could see how this could start to fill your body with a little bit of jealousy. We, it's it's kind of comical here uh, in a bit where, where we see the women came out with tambourines and they're dancing and they're singing. And they're like, oh, Saul did thousands, but David did ten thousands. David has this success that's coming about and, and uh, people are hearing about it and women are singing his praises. And we start to see that jealousy here. It's an example of it It can be a virus that starts very small, but it starts to spread and become deadly. In verse 8, and Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. Again, we see that, that King Saul is starting to compare with David. Thousands and ten thousands, and, and what more can he have? And, he, and he's kind of doing this petty thing. He's comparing. It's a snowball effect. The more we think about what we don't have, the more we become obsessed. Think about that. I mean, isn't that so true and so sad? So often we think about more of what we don't have and what someone else has more than what we have. We start to become invaded with thoughts. And what do I need to do to get to that, to get to where they are? Verse 10, the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. So basically the harp. And, And as he did day by day, And Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled at the spear, for he thought, I will pin a David to the wall, but David invaded him twice. Okay, a couple of things staying out here. One, people are always like, the Bible's boring. Are you kidding me? Like, that is like, it's almost like you don't believe what you just read. Here we go. We have David just playing the harp, and all of a sudden, Saul has a massive spear in his hand, and he thinks about, hey, I'm going to pin him to the wall, and he hurls it, and then we see how quick David is. Like, he's impressive. Like, he throws that harp down and and is able to evade him. One quick thing I want to kind of just touch base on, it said that the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. So basically, it was allowed from God. This harmful spirit was allowed from God. God removed his spirit from Saul's life. And when that happens, right, we can have harmful harmful spirits put upon us. God withdrew his spirit from Saul. So David evaded him twice. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David 
David wasn't even king yet. He's just getting all these praises and he's obviously he's very fast, right? But this jealousy is just spreading rapidly with Saul. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful all of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Verse 12, if you you see that Saul's afraid. Saul is insecure, and he's lost sight in God's anointment on his life. Saul did what Saul wanted to do. He was so full of promise. God says, hey, you are going to be the king of Israel. You're the first king of Israel. I'm going to equip you. You're going to have these gifts, these talents. You're tall. You're mighty. Man, you're going to be incredible. But Saul decided to be disobedient, to do what Saul wanted to do. We are all full of promise. You and I. Every single one of us, we are full of promise. When God knits us together, we are born with promise and the potential to do amazing things for his glory, for his glory. But we like to do what we want to do also. We like to be disobedient. We like to do our path versus God's path. And a lot of time with the flaws not laid out before the Lord, our story can be a tragic story as well. Jealousy overtook Saul. And it's so sad because Saul noticed that same anointment from God on David. David had success on the battlefield, won people over, and had favor with the Lord. And Saul just stopped and just compared his life to his. We have to stop comparing. We have to stop comparing. Saul sat back and watched everyone love and respect David. Saul became an old, bitter, and jealous man. In all of chapter 19 of Samuel, we just see Saul constantly going after David, trying to murder him because this jealousy started to just rot everything good that Saul was. As I was reading this, I was just so like checked. Like so many of us men, we were like, man, I'm like David. Like I'm a man after God's own heart. But I realized, man, we are so much more like Saul. When we stop thinking about how the Lord wants to use us and how we're so full of promise, we start to do things that our flesh wants to do. We start doing things that are outside of God's will and plan. And we say, hey, Chris's way is better. And we go away from God. We compare our lives to each other. And maybe God just wants us to be content with what he has given us. Maybe he just wants us to be content with our jobs, with our success level, with the money in our account, to be obedient in those skills and traits that he's given us because we are each uniquely made a masterpiece as God calls us. I encourage you to read the full story of King Saul. It's pretty incredible. Our second story here is probably one that you might know a little more, a little better. It's the prodigal son. Um, and this jealousy is uh, with, a, with a brother that is just full of frustration. We see just he's just not content, full of frustration, and jealous of, of those that get what they don't deserve. That's, that's that in a nuts, nutshell. So you go ahead and turn in Luke 15. We're going to be in verse 11 through 31. Chapter 15 of Luke is probably my, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible because it's all about Jesus stopping and retelling the same story three different ways so that every single person gets it. And this is, and it's the idea that God is crazy for you and I, that he's ongoing, just pursuing us, and he never stops. So we see here that Jesus tells parables. And this parable has three characters. We, we have the Father, which uh, is all about the Father God, and, we have, and he has two sons. So we're going to read this 
uh, uh, this parable real quick, and we'll kind of break it down. So Luke 15, verse 11, 31. And Jesus said, and he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to, be, worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer really to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. We'll pause there. Let's pause right there. This is an amazing, life-transforming testimony. It should have stopped here. This parable should have stopped here. We have this father. He's got two sons. The younger son, the father's not even passed. He's demanding his inheritance, which is something you would never do. You wouldn't do that 2,000 years ago. You wouldn't do that now. It'd be so disrespectful. Father gives it to him. Gives him the free will, the choice to take it. Goes, spends all of the hard-earned money on reckless living. Spends it all. Not wise at all. And then we see that he's eating out of the pig's troughs. Gets to the lowest of the low. And he's like, man, I had a good at dad's house. And he, and he starts to come up with this little, like, I'm sorry speech, which is an authentic speech. And he goes... And we see that the father has just been waiting for him. And the father takes off and runs toward his son, which during this time when Jesus was speaking this parable, people would have like gasped because Jewish men would have never ran. Uh, but he goes and just runs toward his son and just embraces him and kisses him. And the son starts to his little speech, I am sorry speech, right? Because he doesn't want to be welcomed back as a son. He knows he doesn't deserve it. But he says, hey, I'll just be a servant, and the father interrupts his speech and says, man, bring us the food and the party and the robe and everything. An amazing testimony here. It should have ended here. But God is teaching us something. The son is back. God is making a statement here for his ongoing pursuit. We should celebrate, but the story should have stopped, but it's not. Verse 25 now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And the older son called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, you have devoured, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad 
for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Okay, so this older brother, uh, yeah, he's kind of jealous. I, I kind of chuckle every time I read it. He says, uh, I've never disobeyed your command and you've never given me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. Like he wants like an animal, like he wants a meal and he wants to celebrate with his friends. He's jealous of hearing the music being played, the dancing that's going on. He's jealous of the attention. And he's like, I've done everything right. I've done everything perfect to your will. Yet this guy, this brother destroys your inheritance and you're giving him everything that he doesn't deserve. The older son can't stand the fact that the other son got the calf, got the robe, got the ring. Not happy about the return. I mean, read this and we're like, yeah, man, he's kind of being insane. But that's so many of us. That is me. If I'm being real with you, that is me. This older son is me. Not happy about getting, not happy about someone getting what they don't deserve. Isn't that grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And God is all about grace. And the bottom line is that none of us deserve God's grace. My challenge is to start celebrating. We see here that the son refuses to celebrate on the return of the prodigal son. Instead, is angry, is jealous. But man, to start celebrating. Celebrate other people's awards, their achievements, their gifts. Celebrate those who have received God's grace. I know that's a tough one sometimes. We love the idea of grace when it's for us, but when we see other people getting things that they don't deserve, man, it can be a tough pill to swallow. I love this quote by Timber Hawkeye. Jealousy is the result in counting other blessings instead of your own. Jealousy is the result in counting other blessings instead of your own. Is that true or what? Sometimes I look at others, their things, their success, their achievements, their grace, all of that more than mine. It's actually kind of sad how often, how, how much more I feel like I'm obsessed about other people's achievements than my own. And again, I told you from the beginning, man, I, I struggle with jealousy. I'm, I'm a human. God's working on me. And but man, what if I spend more time actually just looking at what God has given me? Because he's been so good to me. He's been so good to me. So as I close, I want to ask you the question. Are you a jealous person? It's a tough one to answer. It's a tough one to answer. Are you a Saul? Are you jealous of other people's praises and achievements and attention? And are you starting to drift away maybe from God's promise on your life? Or maybe you're also like Saul where you're like, man, I'm jealous of the fire that that person has for the Lord and mine has drifted away. Are you spending too much time constantly thinking about what other people think about that person? Are you going insane? God does not want that for you. Or maybe that's not you. Maybe you're like the older brother in Luke 15 of the prodigal son, the parable. You feel like you're not getting what you deserve. You've done everything right. You've hit all your deadlines. You've pursued everything perfectly. And yet you're not getting promotions. You're not getting favor. You're not getting bonuses or, or you fill in the blank. Or, or you're not getting the things in life that you felt like you should have. Grace. Are you jealous of other people's grace? People getting things that they don't deserve. Well, there's some traits of jealousy to really make you think about where you're at, where you are at in your jealousy meter. And maybe this is a good heart check. It's a heart check for me. Hopefully it's a heart check for you. But here's some the top traits of jealousy. And as I read these, man, ask yourself, man, am I struggling in this? 
Am I struggling in, the, in one of these traits of jealousy? And if you are, maybe it's time to give it over to the Lord. Maybe, maybe it's time to, to put a cap on it before things start to get worse and it starts to spread. So some traits of jealousy here, and then and we'll close up. Diminish achievements. Do you find yourself diminishing other people's achievements? Are you passive aggressive to a person or people that you're jealous of? Do you find yourself not celebrating other people's successes? Are you the quiet one in the group when someone is going about talking about their, uh, their, their success? Are you self-doubting yourself? Are you self-critical? You start to overthink, like, man, am I doing something wrong? Like, what do I need to do to get to that place? What am I missing? What am I not doing? What am I not hitting? Do you obsess about that? Do you have obsessive thoughts just in general or, or behavioral uh, issues toward that person? Again, I said it earlier, do you obsessively think, maybe you don't want to call it uh, obsessive, but do you think more about other people's lives in terms of wanting what they have according to your, or, or instead of your own? Do you have hostility to a person? Do you need constant validation or reassurance from others? Are you angry at all? Are you envy, bitter, insecurity? And these are just to name a few. And my heart is that, man, you hear these and hopefully one of those hits a trigger and you're like, okay, I don't like it. How do I resolve this? How do I get jealousy out of my life? How do you overcome jealousy? It's not easy, yet it is. We have to strive in security. We have to strive in security. It comes down to knowing who you are and who you belong to. Knowing who you are and who you belong to. Being content with how God has made you and how he has blessed you. Remind yourself that that God is for you. He's not against you. I know it sounds church like cliche, but it's so true. We see his scriptures screaming out that he's just constantly pursuing you. He wants to spend forever with you, which is incredible, right? He wants to spend forever with you. He's, it's constantly just crazy about you. Know that God is for you. Set your, set your gifts, right? Understand that they're from him. He carved out a plan for you. And Jesus knows you more than you know yourself. He was there when you were created. Insecurity, insecurity, we all have insecurities. Insecurity comes, is the root of jealousy. That's not being content. Insecurity will leave when you are confident in who you are. Insecurity will leave when you are confident in who you are. When you start to realize, man, Chris, God's made me, man, Not the childhood that I thought I would have, but man, God has formed me. I am able to live a life according to his will, and I'm doing things only because of his goodness and his grace, and I am specifically made for a purpose during this time. I am here to raise my kids, to love my wife, to work at Agora Bible Fellowship. This is who God made me. When you start understanding and have contentment in your life with who you are and where you are, the insecurities disappear promise you. So I want to end with these few verses. First Peter 2, 9 through 10. Second chapter, verse 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received, received mercy. I love this reminder. You and I, we are royalty. May not be royalty here on earth, but we are royalty to God. We are his possession. He pursues us daily as a perfect father. What a gift that is. Proverbs 14.30, a tranquil mind brings life to one's body, but jealousy causes one's bones to rot. God can and wants to give you peace. God 
wants to give you peace. He has equipped you specifically for a purpose. He has equipped me specifically for a purpose. And my purpose looks different from that neighbor, from that person. Your purpose looks different from your neighbor and that person. And that's okay. Be content in that. The last verse here, Proverbs 27, 4. Wrath can be fierce and anger overwhelms, but who can stand up to jealousy? Jealousy may come, but with God, you can claim victory over it. Be confident in who you are. Understand that God is for you. Strive in security. Strive in security. Strive for contentment. This week, I'm going to challenge you. If you are wrestling with this, celebrate someone's victories. Celebrate someone's accomplishments. Do it. It might be hard. You might be like, oh, so proud of you. Like, just do it. You have to start practicing that. Because the reality is, and this is something I've learned, you never know what God is doing in someone else's life. I think so often I think, man, I'm the only one that matters here on earth. My story, my desires, my will, right? God is only working through me. But no, man, he is working through every single person, every single one of us. He's working through all of us, and we do not know the story that he's, that he's weaving together for his purpose. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, just this time to talk about something that, is, uh, that can be hard to, to talk about, this idea of jealousy, this, this, uh, <sighs> this issue that so much of us uh, struggle with. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that there are examples, even though they're tragic stories, in your word, Lord, but you have them there for a purpose so we can learn that uh, jealousy um, can lead to destruction, Lord, and and uh, you desire for us to draw close to you, to be happy, to be content with how you've made us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that your grace is for every single person, Lord. And we pray, Lord, as we, uh, yeah, throughout this week, Lord, that we just, uh, any jealousy that we start to feel, Lord, that it gets uh, um, checked and we uh, just pursue you, Lord, that we hand it over to you, Lord, because we know that you, that you make us confident. When we understand who we are in your eyes, Lord, that comes with security, Lord. We love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a good week.